Hey guys, welcome back to another video. So we made iodine from seaweed in a previous video, or rather extracted it, through a long vigorous procedure, and it was quite a few years ago that I did this, and um, we got maybe a gram of it out of like 10 pounds of seaweed or whatever. Really not efficient. A much more efficient way is to either order it online, which is the most efficient and cost effective way, but um, if you would rather not, you can also extract it from iodine povidone. Now most pharmacies have iodine povidone or iodine tincture. Now in Canada, you can get iodine tincture, about 5 milliliters of it for $5, and it contains like 10% iodine uh, or sodium iodide by weight. So you're not going to get really anything out of that um, that's worth your money and like $5 for 5 mils of stuff is like, oh my gosh, it's a horrible price. Um, Anyhow, I don't know if you can find it at other pharmacies in Canada, but from where I've looked, that's all I can find. And I can't seem to find iodine povidone anywhere. But in Korea, which is where I picked this stuff up, you can actually buy 50 mils of it for 50 cents when you do the conversion rate. So, I picked up a fair amount, and I think I have about 250 mils of uh, iodine povidone here, all of which I got from Korea. Anyhow, so today we're going to be extracting iodine from it. And if you're in other countries, you probably have iodine povidone. And if you're in Canada, perhaps you have a store that sells it. Um, but if not, just go ahead and buy it online. I mean, it's not too expensive. It's actually pretty cheap. I think you can buy 50 grams for about $8, which is way more than we're going to be able to extract from this. Anyhow, so the first step to do is to take approximately 200 mils of water and prepare a sodium hydroxide solution. So I have about 80 grams of sodium hydroxide here, which we will slowly add to this water with vigorous stirring to help dissolve. And then I'll meet you back. Okay, so now we have a nice concentrated solution of sodium hydroxide, perfect for a reaction. However, our solution is very hot, so we should let it cool down a bit for, before the next step. But um, I forgot to mention, but it is very important to stick on gloves and safety glasses, because sodium hydroxide is quite rather corrosive, and solutions of this concentration could very easily cause severe chemical burns. Anyhow, so we'll let this cool down a bit before proceeding to the next step, which will be slowly adding it to this iodine povidone solution. Now what we're essentially doing is, um, we're, uh, there's actually iodine dissolved, or that's complexed with the povidone and the povidone soluble in water, because iodine is only sparingly soluble in water, whereas povidone is much more soluble. And this is actually a, I believe, 11% solution according to the bottles. Anyhow. So, when we add the sodium hydroxide to the iodine povidone solution, the iodine should react with the sodium uh, hydroxide, forming sodium iodide, sodium iodate, and uh, some sort of gooey complex with the povidone, which uh, should hopefully precipitate out, so we can actually filter it off and be left with a nice solution of iodine or uh, sodium iodide, sodium iodate, um, which both would be dissolved in water, so we'd be able to filter off any of the other insoluble stuff. The uh, sodium iodide and sodium iodate can then be easily purified uh, back to elemental iodine through a couple of other addition processes, and there are several different methods to do so. Uh, my particular favorite one is the uh, generation of large amounts of chlorine gas and bubbled through the solution to convert it to sodium chloride and elemental iodine, because for me that's the most efficient um, uh, as far as it goes for me. That's a, uh, how I did it uh, when I did it, uh, extract the iodine from seaweed. But um, we're probably going to use a different method just because it's faster and much safer. But um, if you're looking for a percent yield, I suggest bubbling uh, some chlorine gas or your solution of sodium iodide and sodium iodate. Anyhow, besides the point, we'll let this cool and I'll meet you back. Okay, so it's a bit cooler now. It's still quite warm to the touch, but it's definitely uh, cold enough that we can handle it. So we're going to be slowly adding it to our iodine povidone here. Uh, being careful to swirl around the jar in between additions. And we're just doing this until the dark color of iodine, uh, the iodine color, disappears. Um, and when this happens, we'll be left with a nice, rather colorless solution of sodium iodide and sodium iodate. So I'll continue the addition and meet you back. As you can see, it's getting much, much, much lighter. And as we add more, you can see it gets lighter and lighter. And at this point, it's nearly uh, colorless. So uh, we'll probably just add in the rest of this. This looks like about the perfect amount. And um, swirl it around and see if we need to add a bit more. We may need to prepare a bit more solution, but um, it looks like it's pretty much been reacted. So upon looking at the solution from above, we can actually see that that red stuff there is actually some sort of precipitated out polymer 
It is actually quite rather goopy here, and uh, this would need to be removed. Removed. Um, the yellow color of the solution is actually due to the presence of sodium iodate, as I mentioned earlier, which has a characteristic yellow color. Um, but we will need to remove this polymer before filtration so that it doesn't clog up our filters easily. So we'll scoop that out of there, uh, filter it through some coffee filters, and I'll meet you back when we have our solution. Okay, so it's been removed from the solution and went directly into my trash can. However, the polymer appears to be very, very goopy and sticky and stuck all over my gloves. So I'll have to remove these and get some new ones, but I just reached my hand in there and scooped it out. Because I do have gloves on, so the very basic solution will not hurt me. So quickly remove these, and get some new gloves on, and then we'll do the filtration. So after filtering, our solution is much more clear, however it's still cloudy. This is because we still have a bit of that polymer uh, dissolved in solution, but as we boil down the solution, it will rapidly decrease in um, solubility, and therefore come out of solution, and we can scoop it off. So. Now let's transfer it to a larger container, so we'll just transfer it to this 1 liter Erlenmeyer flask here, and we're going to end up boiling this down to get rid of all the rest of the polymer. So it looks like we have approximately 400 or uh, 200 milliliters of solution here, so um, we can boil this down to probably about 50 milliliters, and all of our sodium iodide and um, sodium iodate should stay in solution. However, hopefully, the um, polymer will come out of solution. Then we can proceed to the next step. But um, we really need to get rid of that polymer because it's going to end up affecting our final purity if we just continue on from this point. So I'll begin to boil it down until it's about a quarter of its volume. Okay, so I've now transferred our boiled down solution to this Erlenmeyer flask again after filtration. But um, I've let it cool down back to room temperature and stuff has started to precipitate out. I'm assuming this is probably sodium iodide and sodium iodate. Not totally sure, it could be a uh, polymer, but I'm hoping it's sodium iodide and sodium iodate. Um, and I don't really want to filter off then discard it because that would be losing some of our product. Anyhow, you should do this in a tall um, flask that's uh, similar to this, um, such as an Erlenmeyer flask, because it has a conical shaped head so that any splashing that is, uh, which there's typically splashing when you do the next step. Um, when, if there is any splashing, we'll stay inside the beaker and shouldn't splash out and uh, throw stuff everywhere, which would be a loss. So that's why I'm doing this in an Erlenmeyer flask. So we'll ta simply take a funnel or something, throw it in the top of this, whoops, throw it in the top of this, and we're going to just start slowly adding some hydrochloric acid until the point of where it's about a yellow solution. Now we're going to be neutralizing all of our sodium hydroxide, which we added earlier at the very beginning. And because we had a very large excess of sodium hydroxide and the solution is strongly basic, we're going to get a lot of heat generated and also a lot of splashing as the water boils. Um, this is basically an acid-based neutral neutralization reaction where we're producing a bunch of sodium chloride in water as we neutralize it. And um, iodine is formed in the process, but it uh, reacts with um, sodium iodide forming sodium triiodide, uh, which is yellow. And you will actually see the brown color of iodide being produced at the beginning, but it quickly complexes and then the solution goes clear. As soon as we're left with a kind of yellowish orange solution, that should be our end point and we can stop adding hydrochloric acid. I'll get the hydrochloric acid out and meet you back. Okay, so we can now begin to slowly add hydrochloric acid. This is just muriatic acid and was bought at Home Depot. Or, uh, can could be bought at Home Depot, but I bought this uh, particular stuff from Canadian Tire. Anyhow, so we'll slowly add a bit in. And as you can see, very hot. And there were lots of splashing, which is why we did this in this flask like this. Anyhow, I'm just going to be careful about the addition and we'll slowly do it. And I'll meet you back when no more fizzing occurs and we have a slightly uh, yellowish solution. Okay, so we've added all the hydrochloric acid, and it appears to be at its end point. You can see there's a little pile in the, in the middle that's most likely just sodium chloride because our solution is super saturated. Now that cloudy stuff we had before seems to have disappeared, which makes me think it was indeed sodium iodide or sodium iodate, and with the increase of water from the acid-base neutralization reaction, hopefully we have um, actually dissolved any sodium iodide slash iodate that actually precipitated out. And now everything's in solution, except for excess salt, which has precipitated out. So, more salt will precipitate out as the solution cools, so we will cool the solution back down to room temperature, um, at which point we will do a quick filtration to remove all the excess salt. Then I will meet you back.
Make sure you have some 3% hydrogen peroxide for the next step. Okay, so it's been filtered off and I'll transfer this large jar here. And um, we just have a bit of hydrogen peroxide here. And this is just 3% uh, stuff, and we're going to dump in the full 500 milliliter bottle directly into here. We should notice a color change, and iodine is now going to be start starting to be precipitated out in its elemental form. As you can see it went brown. I actually won't add all of it, or else we're going to float, overflow that. It's probably about 400 milliliters. You see it's gone brown, and now elemental iodine has been formed. It should precipitate out to the bottom, at which point we can collect it. So we will now just wait until this settles out, and I'll meet you back. It'll probably take 10 minutes or so. And what was left over in the uh, filtrate, um, after filtering it out, filtering off the salt, there was some sort of yellowish orange stuff. Not sure what that is, but I think I might dissolve that into solution and add some hydrogen peroxide to it, just to see if we get any iodine from that too. Anyhow, so we'll let this settle out and meet you back. Okay, I just transferred our iodine solution back into the large Erlenmeyer flask because it darkened as you saw and then over the course of the past night because like when I initially added it no iodine crystals formed and the solution just continued to get lighter and lighter and lighter so I left it overnight to see if anything would happen and now it's back to yellow um, although it's much more yellow than when we started but um I really don't know what is happening because the iodine should not be reacting with any sodium chloride or anything and uh, yeah I really am quite confused with what's happened, but clearly the iodine has somehow gone back into solution. This happens every single time I try this. I'm not sure why, um, because other people have tons of success with this method. Anyhow, so basically what we're going to, or what, yeah, what I'm going to attempt to do is, um, if this doesn't work for you, let's set up a uh, simple distillation apparatus and get, start to actually distill off the upper aqueous, or like the, um, all the water from it, and hopefully we'll be left with the salt which maybe we can dissolve into a minimal amount of water, bubble chlorine gas through, and break apart whatever compound is formed with the iodine, releasing the iodine. Because whatever has happened to the iodine, chlorine is a much more reactive halogen than iodine, so chlorine will displace the iodine from whatever compound it has formed. Hopefully. But, there's way too much water in here right now, so I'm just going to boil off, or distill off almost all of this liquid, and then we should be left with a nice salt. And also, using a distillation apparatus, uh, instead of just boiling it off, it's a nice enclosed space, so if something miraculously happens and we're starting to vaporize iodine, hopefully what will happen is the iodine will actually condense in the condensing column so that we can hopefully collect our iodine crystals, if something like that happens. I'm not totally sure what will happen, we'll just see. Another thing to note is that when more hydrogen peroxide is added, nothing happens. Um, at, or at this stage, at least, nothing happens. Anyhow. So, I'll go ahead and start distilling this off. Okay, so our solution's been heating for a couple hours now, and it started to turn back into the brownish iodine color solution um, from that yellow solution, which is great. And I can notice a faint purple gas above it. And, if we look up here, this is really exciting, there's actually iodine crystals which are uh, recondensing on the top of the uh, condenser column up there. Um, and I don't have a thermometer in right now. Anyhow. We have been distilling a bit of liquid, which is just mostly water, but um, I'm really excited because we have that iodine that's collecting at the top. So I'll just let this run for quite a lot longer, and hopefully we'll get lots of iodine crystals at the top, which we can scrape out. I hope that's what happens at least. Um, anyhow, so I'll continue this on, and meet you back after several, several, several hours. Um, this is a wonderful way to regenerate the iodine if um, you run into the problem that I have, where the iodine never actually precipitates out of solution. Anyhow, besides the fact, we'll let this run. Okay, so after distilling all that over, um, we collected most of the liquid in a ram bottom flask here, and after it was done, I just transferred it back to here, because we'll do a couple more distillations in the future, um, as we're going to get more iodine out of this. Now, basically, there's a bunch of iodine on the side of the flask there that came over, and um, a majority of it is actually... You can see it's right there in the condenser at the end, and also... In this part, there's quite a bit there. So, um, basically, that's where all the iodine was coming over and, and crystallizing there. So, um, distillation uh, proves to be a very viable method to uh, remove the iodine from solution to actually create crystals. Very excited about this. So, we will now scrape off the crystals, 
transfer them to an appropriate vial, and repeat the distillation of this two, three, or four more times to get as much iodine out as possible until it looks like there's no more coming out. Then we'll do a percent yield, and well, not a percent yield because I don't know um, the exact concentration of the solution. It was around 11%, I think, but I got rid of the bottles. Anyhow, but we will see how much we got out of that 250 milliliters or so of iodine povidone. Anyhow, so I'll scrape that out and meet you back. Okay, so I slowly distilled it, so it was like one drip every five to ten seconds or so, and it took about three and a half days, but um, by slowly, slowly doing this, this allows the iodine to crystallize on the top of the condenser column, while um, letting the drips below um, continue through. So we were left with a bunch of nice crystalline iodine, or iodine. Um, anyhow, so, over here, as you can see, it was all filtered off, it will remove this out of the way. And um, we're left with our solutions, which are colored brown due to a little bit of dissolved iodine, but um, it's mostly now been filtered off. But that's not all of it, because I had to swip or swap out the uh, receiving flask a couple of times, so the uh, rest of the iodine is actually in this small little bottle here. So um, I'm guessing that we have about one gram or so of iodine, but um, after I filtered it off, I simply stuck it on a vacuum uh, filter uh, for a bit, so that it would hopefully remove as much of the uh, liquid as possible, drying it as much as possible. Because leaving iodine open in, um, or iodine open in um, air for long periods of time will actually cause it to sublimate to, um, into a gas and evaporate away. Um, then you will have no more, so uh, it must be stored in an airtight container and can't just be dried in the air, or else you'll start losing product. So, um, I'm guessing we have about a gram or so from that 250 milliliters of iodine povidone that we started with. And, um, I mean, that's a fair amount, but, um, it's really not a viable method. Considering this cost me about $2, um, or $2.50, uh, from Korea, so I guess it's not super expensive, but for $8, you could get 50 grams. So, it's not economically viable. And in Canada, iodine povidone is much, much more expensive. Anyhow, that's essentially how to make iodine from iodine povidone, and I hope you guys enjoyed. And this iodine here will be used to make a compound known as potassium iodide, which can be used as a catalyst in several different reactions, uh, mainly through the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, which is something I've always wanted to do. And um, it can also be used in an experiment known as gold rain, in which we take uh, lead nitrate and mix it with a solution of potassium iodide, and a beautiful gold precipitate forms, and it looks like it's raining gold. It's something I've always wanted to do, and I think it would be very neat to do. So I do plan on doing that. Anyhow, so it's essentially how to make iodine, and um, it, it's a very useful compound, or uh, sorry, a uh, very useful element. And uh, another application would be to make uh, the high intensity explosive nitrogen triiodide, which is one of the most sensitive explosives known to man. I've made this in the past, and it's very fun to make. Um, slightly dangerous, but it's still pretty cool. So I uh, hope we'll do a video on that soon. Anyhow, hope you guys enjoyed. Wait, bye.